So I'm Will Kirby in uh, Avonbury near Bromyard at Brookhouse Farm. And what do you, are you the, um, what is this your farm? So I'm a partner in the farm with my wife and my parents. Uh, we took the farm over two years ago and um, we have been, you know, when we moved here, we thought about how to modernize the farm. We were quite lucky we had a profitable cider business, but we wanted a couple of things to go along with that. So it, the farm use, is in a very beautiful setting. We've got lovely views over towards the Malvern. So we put in some glamping units, which are going well. They're managed by another couple who live on site. And then it used to be a quite a notable hop farm in the area there are only limited parts of the country where you can grow hops and about half the hops in the uk are grown within about 10 miles of here so we looked at hops and the increase in craft brewing recently and their beers typically use a lot more hops than the lager you can buy in a supermarket so we decided to complement the apples and the glamping with a, a hop enterprise so I suppose the question that everybody asks you is, <laughs> um, you know, that you said to us and lots of people have said to us that the barriers to entry into, the, you know, putting up a new hop yard are quite prohibitive, which is why it doesn't tend to happen. What, what made you kind of think differently on that, really? Well, the barriers to entry, a, a lot of farming businesses are very cyclical. So if the potato price rises, a potato farmer might put in a lot more potatoes or... If chicken farming is very profitable around here, a lot of farmers have put in large chicken sheds. And because I, I guess I, I'm not from a farming background, I used to work in the city, I was looking for an enterprise with barriers to entry. And hop, hop growing is not easy. They're very susceptible to a range of different diseases and pests. The amount of capital required is substantial. So not only do you have the trellis work, which is very labor intensive and quite skilled, you also have all the picking and kilning machinery. Most crops you can harvest or, or grow and take to market or send off on a truck. With hops, you have to do a lot of post harvest processing because as soon as you've picked a hop cone, it begins to rot or decompose in the field. So you've got maybe two or three hours to dry it, which means you have to have almost an industrial unit which can process those hops to get the best quality for brewers and that has to happen on farm. So was that, tell us about what you've got here compared to what people might say, we're probably people are used to seeing the hop kilns and things aren't they? What's... So yeah, 50 or 60 years ago typically a farm would have a setup like this where um, farms were put, where hops were put into pockets and carried off the farm in, in large sacks. And it's quite labour intensive. You'd have a lot of workers scuppeting the hops, which is an old Herefordshire word, and to put the air through them, drive the moisture out. Um, whereas I went round the world looking at different hop processing technologies. And they're generally either in northern Bavaria, which grows about 40% of the world's hops, or in the Pacific Northwest in Washington State, and that area grows another 40%. And they've um, invested a lot in technology to reduce the labour requirement and perhaps improve the quality of the product once it has been processed. So as a result of that, we, um, on our picking machinery side, we're using a combination of old English machinery, which was made in Suckley, about um, five miles from here, and some machinery from the Hallettau. So our kiln is made by a company called Wolf and they use various technologies to, to reduce labour and, and hopefully improve quality. So although this is kind of a new venture, there's quite a lot of history here, isn't there? So can you just tell us a little bit about the history of the farm and you've got some kind of, you've got links with hops from your, is it your grandfather and then you've got things like Peter Davis's froth machine and the link with Harvey Davis. Just tell us a little bit about the kind of the history yeah. and your link to it. So my family on my father's side is originally from um, the Black Country, which is where a lot of hop pickers came from traditionally before the process was automated and before farmers started to use more Eastern European labour. There was a almost a huge migration at the end of August of hop pickers from Dudley and Warsaw 
down to Herefordshire to manually get the hops in. And my father, my grandfather rather, in his autobiography or memoir that he left, just he wrote just before he died, talked about the family's links with a farm down in Herefordshire and there were marriages between the families. And so I like to think we've, we've closed a circle somehow by me getting back involved in hops. And my father has also been very involved in getting our hop picking machinery up and running. Um, but, and this farm was previously a hop farm, though, though it's not the farm that was connected to my family there. It was Brookhouse Farm in King's Pyon, where they used to go, and this farm's called Brookhouse Farm. Um, our hop picking machine came from a large hop farm down in Claston near Dormington, just east of Hereford. Um, and that farm converted from picking tall hops on traditional high trellis work to uh, low trellis or dwarf hops. And for dwarf hops, they used a lot of the old machinery, but some parts, so the, the plucker bank, which strips the cones off the, the tall wire work is not necessary for short, for, for dwarf hops. So that equipment was surplus to their requirements. We managed to, um, to buy it and we've just about got it up and running in time for harvest this year. So tell us a bit about that then, about your first um, your first half, main harvest, because what, tell us what you were doing last year and what you're doing this year. And... Well, this year, last year we were harvesting, we wanted to get almost a dress rehearsal in, so we had some hops which looked healthy. We didn't have to harvest them, but it was nice to have that little bit of cash and to get experience of drying. So we harvested about one hectare, um, we borrowed a neighbour's uh, picking machinery and another kind neighbour, Charles Pudge, down in Bishop's Froome, allowed us to use his kilns. And we picked uh, six pockets, which I was very proud of. Uh, this year, uh, we're looking to do it all ourselves, partly for biosecurity and partly just because the volume is, you know, an order of magnitude greater. Um, and so we've spent a lot of the last year welding and grinding and building our, our processing facility. So touch wood, not much wood, five weeks to go. Um, I really hope, you know, we'll be there at the end of August because you don't have much time with hops between when they're ready to pick and when they're past it, you've only got about a week per variety. And so we can't afford to have any failures during hop picking. Why? Yeah, so our varieties, we're growing a mixture of traditional English varieties, most of which nowadays get exported. And the reason they like traditional English varieties from the UK is because our climate and our terroir allow the hops to develop that subtle, her herby almost flavour. Whereas if you take a, an English hop and you grow it in Germany, you'll get different flavours. Having said that, we were also keen to support some of these more modern breweries, which are growing very hoppy IPAs. And so we've imported some planting material from other countries and we're growing Cascade, Chinook and Centennial, which are much punchier, citrusy, almost um, American varieties. And we're also looking to grow some of the newer varieties, which are being bred here in the UK, partly to address that market. But is there a link to why you can grow so many different varieties? What was the reason that you can do that? Was it well, we're, hop growers generally grow three or four, at least three or four different varieties so that they can space out their harvesting windows. So you might have a week to pick your goldings. And as soon as your goldings are finished, your challenger becomes ready to pick. And then later on, you might be picking Cascade or, or Pilgrim, which is a, an alpha, a bittering variety. There's something about the, the wilt resistance. Or yeah, and so... You don't have to. If you don't no, I, I can yeah. do, yeah. So um, there have been issues with growing traditional English varieties in parts of the UK, and that's because wilt, um, which is a fungal disease which grows through the soil and is very difficult to get rid of, has a big impact on those varieties. So fuggles and goldings which are the quintessential English bitter varieties, um, are very wilt susceptible. 
So that makes us quite lucky. We, we suffer from a lack of multi-generational institutional experience in hop growing. But one advantage we have is that our soil is wilt free. Hops haven't been grown here for many years and they were removed before the wilt became an issue, which means that we can grow Fuggles and Golding and sell them to traditional English breweries. Whereas some of our neighbors aren't in that position or they might grow a form of Goldings, which is more difficult to grow. Okay. Imagine um, the economics of being in hop farming now compared to somebody maybe farming like Peter Davis was kind of post-war era and things like that. What, what would you see the kind of major differences are? Well, the major differences well, just economically. Sort of economically, maybe, because it's always quite good in sort of historical terms when people say, oh, well, you could buy a pound of apples for two pence, then they push you too quick. Do you know what I mean? Is there, have you got any kind of examples comparison. or comparison? I don't, you may not um, have. But have you got any kind of thought on um, the hop industry used to be much more highly regulated than it was now so hop farmers would be given a quota um, whereas now it's much more of a free market and you're competing with uh, with imports but in, in many ways as a hop grower you're not competing with German hops or with American hops you're almost competing with very lightly hopped lager so a kilo of our hops might make over a thousand pints of relatively tasteless supermarket fizz. It might make 100, 200 pints of classic British bitter beer, it might make only 40 pints of a very strongly powerfully hopped IPA. And as those IPAs become more popular, that, that's driving up the hop price. So when we first came to see you, you said something quite nice. You said that you'd sort of fallen in love a little bit too much with hops. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, I think um, my wife and I were thinking of different things to do with the farm. Um, that was mostly a uh, numbers-based process. So we didn't want just want something to keep us busy. We wanted to make the farm a thriving business where we could reinvest in nice opportunities. We could pay our suppliers on time we could employ people locally and um, I went to my first hop picking I think it was in 2015 one of my neighbours who's now head of the British Hop Association took me around some farms during hop harvest and I didn't just like the bustle I suppose I, I liked the smell and the um, there's something about hops which makes them very different from other crops at least I think but I, I need to protect myself from falling in love with hops more than uh, is financially justifiable, I suppose. At, at one level, scale is a good thing in business. It drives down costs. But I, I uh, my wife jokes about having become a hop widow and um, I don't want it to take my life over excessively. Okay. So um, what do you kind of, where do you see yourself going with this in the future? So you've gone from six... Was it six acres to 45 acres to what's the plan? Yeah, so we've built a harvesting centre, a processing facility, which can harvest many times more hops than we have in the ground now. Having said that, um, as you grow more and more hops, typically it's become hard for farmers to enforce quality Um and inspect the crop for disease as intensively as they should do so so there may well be a limit on the natural size of a hop farm but currently we're planning to put more yards in so long as the price remains high enough for us to generate an economic return so long as we're enjoying it and, and the guys on the farm are enjoying it there are farms in the u.s which are where one single farm harvests more hops than the entire uk hop industry I'm not saying we're going to get anywhere near that size, but it suggests that there is room to expand and hopefully as brewers and consumers of beer become more aware of British hop varieties, you know, we'll be able to expand as the market expands. Because hops are so susceptible to different diseases and because there are so many manual processes, handwork, which needs doing out in the field, some of which is quite skilled, 
it, it's difficult for a potato farmer in Lincolnshire or a daffodil farmer in Cornwall to suddenly wake up and say, I want to grow hops. That expertise only exists in very limited geographic regions. And so we're very lucky we've been, we've been able to tap into a lot of those skills locally. So our hop manager is from a hop farming family. He grew up on a hop farm. He's worked at some of the biggest hop farms in the area. And um, there have been other farmers in Suffolk and in Yorkshire who've tried to grow hops uh, and it hasn't worked. Um, and so I hope we can break that recent trend of new hop farmers failing and build a thriving business here. So do you think that's all linked to the, the heritage then of having the hops in the county for so many generations? Yeah, I think so. I, I can walk into the lo I could walk into the local pub during hop drying and I could find five or six people who will be able to tell me when a hop is too dry or, or when it's just right. Because if you sell your hop, if you dry your hops insufficiently and they're 12 or 13% moisture, you put them in a bale and they're likely to self-ignite, which will give you a, a horrific kiln fire and probably destroy part of your crop. Um, if you dry them down to six or seven percent, you're removing a lot of the oils which brewers want, and you're you're um, foregoing that extra little bit of water in your bale, which will boost your profits slightly. And I think that kind of expertise it isn't distributed evenly throughout the world or throughout the country, and so yeah, it, it's really helped us. And what what do you think people make of you? The, local, the old time farmers in the most of the farmers around here have told me uh, that I need my head seeing to or that uh, I'll quit after my first proper hop harvest um, yeah no um, it does give me the heebie-jeebies slightly um, because a lot of the older hop farmers around here perhaps came out of hops 10 years ago they've done quite well out of cider apples but none of them have gone back into hops and um, there might well be a reason for that, but you know, I, I'm I'm young, and um, so I've got a chance to make my mistakes early. Um, are there any? So that's all. That's are there any? What do you see are the major kind of challenges? Really, I mean, do you think there's going to be challenges around getting labour with the I mean, with the whole Brexit thing and all that kind of? Yeah, I mean, one reason we were keen to stop growing corn. Or, or a lower value crop and move into more intensive horticultural farming is so that if subsidies do get removed, the subsidy becomes a less important part of your farm's income. Um, access, the, the other big EU angle for a farm like this is, is access to Eastern European labour. Our hop shed has been built largely with Eastern European labour. Our hops are trained with Eastern European labour. We have string put up in the hop yards with Eastern European labour. I'm really grateful to those guys for coming over here and living away from their homes. And, you know, we pay better than your average farm, but, but it's not an expat salary. Um, and if uh, access to Eastern European labour continues to be, or is made more difficult as a result of Brexit. It will be very hard for farms like this. It will be very hard for British farm, British brewers to produce British beers with British hops. We've invested a fair amount in automation, but there are certain jobs which you just can't get a machine to do. It's a challenge for the future, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, other challenges. Um, I I guess disease. Keeping the wilt out and keeping various other bugs and um, fungi which can infect hops is very hard work. We've got a good team here, we work very hard at it. And then I guess the other challenge, the other biggest challenge would be the hop price. We've entered into fairly long contracts for some of our hops, but we might have to stop planting new hop yards or even pull yards out if the price becomes unsustainable. And I think that price and the growing popularity of um, beer with very few hops in is really what's uh, led to the big declines in UK hop acreage over the last few decades. Yeah, so it's just really just more for us really. This bit is, um, 
you know, do you think what we're doing is of any importance or of interest to people? Well, you know, we we sort of feel it is, but in terms of why do you think it might be important to kind of look at the history of hops and also kind of the future of it, really? Well, I think there are a lot of people, particularly in the black country in the East End, who have very fond memories of hop picking and the smells and their, their time out of the city and in the oh, countryside. Sorry. About sorry. people from black country... And so I think a, a lot of people of that generation have very fond memories of coming back to Herefordshire or going hopping down in Kent and the time they spent with their families out and about was a nice break for them from urban life, although people tend to over-romanticise the past, I suppose. I should think they work very hard, but you know, if they have fond memories, it's nice for those memories to be uh, rekindled, I guess. Um, I also think um, a lot of people on a hot summer's day enjoy a, a British pint and you can't make a British beer without British hops and it, it's quite nice to show people where those where those hops come from and all the work that goes into it at this end. So you know, if you're paying an extra 50p for a can of Brewdog over a can of um, imported lager you can see where that 50p is being spent and all the, the love and the care which goes into hop growing in, in an area like this. Being interviewed today, have you enjoyed it? Have you? Yeah, I suppose so. It's quite a new experience, but um, no, it's been fine, yeah. It's been all right. <laughs> I, I think, it, like I said the other day, I mean, um, hasn't been easy for a lot of these. For, I mean, I just, you know, I'm enthusiastic and new to yeah. this industry. But for someone like Mark Andrews, who you met briefly yeah. earlier, he's been through very, very hard times. Not him in particular, but most of the hop growers around here have carried on doing it for love, not for money. And, um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, just tell us a bit about the, the wire work and Mervyn, you're saying he's the, one of the last few people that knows how to do it, or the last. So building wire work is technically very difficult. You're almost trying to create a, a building or a platform out in the field which will support the weight of these hot binds. And as we go through August towards harvest, if there's a storm and it's raining heavily, you can have a wire work taking, you can have your trellis taking hundreds of tons of load and you really need a man building this who knows what he's doing. A lot of that expertise has, has died out and Mervyn is the last man in the country who knows how to put up a hop yard. He's a contractor. And so we're very lucky he lives just three or four miles south of here. And he comes here and builds hop yards with his team, sometimes using our guys. And um, he learned the process from his father and his son started to get involved now, though he does some other stuff also. And so we hope to be able to keep this skill going. So what will happen then if he's the only person that knows how to do it? There are some farmers who still have the skills themselves and they build, up, build their own wire work. Don't tell Mervyn this, but we're trying to pick up some of these skills ourselves. So if he is hit by a bus, we'd at least be able to have a stab at it. So he's the only one that goes around different farms doing it for... That's right, yeah. So he, uh, I joke with him, he goes out on tour, he spends time down in Kent giving advice down there and then he has a team up here who've built, Mervyn or his father have built most of the hop yards um, in this part of the world. So if you're ever drinking a British beer, chances are those hops were grown up wire work, which was built by, uh, by Mervyn Carlos.